Welcome to section 4 of the Parasites. This is our overview figure showing the parasites you need to know for step 1. In this lecture, we will be talking about the first CNS parasite, Toxoplasma gondii, which you can see right here. Our story takes place in a beautiful pasture inhabited by peaceful but strong people. We will introduce those strong, peaceful people soon. For now, let's focus on these ruthless invaders. These invaders are wearing suits with the toxic symbol on them. They are even spraying toxins on the local vegetation to kill them. Anyways, toxic stands for Toxoplasma gondii, the parasite we're discussing in this image. You may have noticed that these toxic invaders are felines. These cat monsters, especially the one that stepped in its own litter box, will help you remember that cat feces can transmit Toxoplasma gondii. The people have a force field protecting them for the most part. This invading cat got its arm chopped off in the force field, which caused it to bleed horribly. You can see his hand on the inside of that force field barrier, and one of the other toxic suit comrades is collecting the blood as it falls to the ground. He's hoping to learn about the enemy's defenses by examining the fresh blood that made contact with the barrier. You can see him place that blood in the vial. This represents the fact that Toxoplasma gondii is diagnosed using serology. Now let's introduce the first good guy of the story, a big hulking hero. The innocent people like to keep him around to help protect them from any invaders. You can see he's good at his job because he just grabbed one of the cat monsters and took a bite out of him. Kind of a grotesque way to fight, but at least he's on the good guy's side. Anyways, if you look at the exposed meat, you'll see a bunch of cysts. This demonstrates the fact that one can contract Toxoplasma gondii through eating meat infected with cysts. That means there are two important ways to get infected, eating meat with cysts or eating cat feces. Now here's a cat who has successfully made it through the force field. He has used his torch to burn a hole. This torch stands for torches infections. Torches is a mnemonic that clinicians like to use to remember infections that a mother can pass to the fetus. T stands for Toxoplasma gondii, one of the torches infections. In this idea, the force field barrier represents the placenta, and the fact that the cat is able to burn through the barrier will help you remember that Toxoplasma gondii can cross the placenta, and that's what makes it a congenital torches infection. Now look at this warrior standing confidently eyeing that cat invader. She knows she can take him, so she keeps her cool and is even wearing her sunglasses. If you look closely, you can see the reflection of the flames on her lenses. The flames on the lenses represent inflammation of the choroid and retina of the eye, which is called chorioretinitis. Chorioretinitis is very harmful to the fetus, as you can imagine. So again, flames reflecting off the glasses stands for chorioretinitis. Now you can see this brave little infant at the mom's feet. This little infant of the brave mother isn't going to sit idly by and let his home be invaded. You can see him being proactive and throwing the only weapon he understands, his bottle. You can see that bottle crack against the cat's skull, dripping milk all over it. Milk is known for its high calcium content, so in this way, the milk represents calcification, and the fact that it's on the cat's skull represents intracranial calcifications, which often occurs in fetal toxoplasmosis. Now here we have a purple guy, the supervillain leading the invasion commanding all those toxic cat monsters to do his bidding. Right now, it appears he has accidentally clogged the hose his toxic troopers were using to kill the nearby vegetation. If you look at that hose, you can see there's a buildup of fluid here before the blockage. This represents how Toxoplasma gondii can block proper flow of the cerebral spinal fluid and can lead to hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus simply means there's a buildup of CSF in the ventricles. If you need a review on hydrocephalus, this is discussed in great detail in the neurology chapter. Now the reason the villain was so distracted, enough so that he would step on the hose, is because he's trying to shock this poor girl's brain using his rings of power. You can see those rings on his hand right there. He is trying to torture her for information that could help him defeat her tribe within that force field. These rings shocking that girl's brain, revealing it, represents the ring-enhancing brain lesions that patients can experience. Now, this symptom does not occur in congenital infections. It only occurs in immunocompromised AIDS patients. We like to use stretchers, like the one the girl is on, to represent immunocompromised patients. And the fact that she has a big band-aid on her leg stands for AIDS. So bringing these ideas together should help you remember that in AIDS patients, you can see ring-enhancing brain lesions. Now this is an MRI showing a ring-enhancing brain lesion, such as that found in toxoplasmosis. So this is what a ring-enhancing lesion from toxoplasmosis would look like. But keep in mind that ring-enhancing lesions like this can also be seen in AIDS patients with EBV-induced primary central nervous system lymphoma. Now it's also important to know that Toxoplasma gondii doesn't create ring-enhancing brain lesions in AIDS patients until their CD4 T-cell count falls below 100. To help you remember this, we have the poor victim trying to pay off her assailant with a $100 bill. So $100 bill for CD4 count below 100. Now that we've talked about how Toxoplasma gondii affects AIDS patients and fetuses, let's talk about how most people with Toxoplasma infections will present. As you can see, one of the monsters has captured this young boy and is yanking his collar. 
nearly choking the kid. This represents pharyngitis. Now we see these heat lamps scattered throughout the area. The people of this area like to keep these heat lamps to keep them warm. These heat lamps represent fever, another common symptom that healthy patients complain of. Upon hearing her village was being invaded, this warrior ran for miles to get here. You can see she is exhausted and can barely stay awake. This represents fatigue, common to immunocompetent patients with toxoplasmosis. So again, tired from running stands for fatigue. So going back, we've discussed that infected patients with healthy immune systems will have pharyngitis, fever, and fatigue. And these symptoms are strikingly similar to EBV, or mononucleosis infections. Because they are similar, toxoplasma patients often get a monospot test, which is, of course, negative since they don't have mono. Another name for the monospot test is a heterophile antibody test. In the EBV image, there are numerous arrows flying through the sky, but all the arrows look different, or hetero, as in heterophile antibodies. However, in this toxoplasmosis image, you can see that all the arrows look the same, indicating that there are no heterophile antibodies present in toxoplasmosis. And you may recall from the EBV image that there was a spotlight spotting all those heterophile antibodies. In this image, the spotlight is broken, indicating the monospot test is negative. So again, Though toxoplasma patients have fever, pharyngitis, and fatigue, they do not have mononucleosis, so their heterophile antibody test, also known as the monospot test, will be negative. Now look at this warrior who has caught one of those cat monsters. She is kind of like a pirate, so you can see her eye patch and pants are pretty pirate-like. Next, notice that she has a wagon full of meth. This meth she uses to disarm her opponents. As you can see, her meth powder has worked at disabling this cat monster. Bringing these ideas together, we have pirate meth, which stands for pyrimethamine. Pyrimethamine is part of an effective treatment regimen for toxoplasmosis. Now looking further back behind this pirate meth character, we have this magician playing with sulfur and dice. As you can see, that smelly sulfur powder she's mixing up is choking out that cat monster. Also, she keeps dice at the bottom of that powder pit. She uses these dice as a part of her magic weapon, believing that dice increase the potency to the sulfur if she rolls a certain number. Bringing these ideas together, we have sulfur dice, which stands for sulfadiazine, another part of the treatment for toxoplasmosis. Now that we've covered all the items in the image, let's do a question to apply what you've learned. A 24-year-old G2 P1 female presents at 17 weeks gestation with a fever, sore throat, and fatigue. She describes her fatigue as different than the fatigue she experienced with her previous pregnancy. She feels healthy otherwise and does not have a history of HIV exposure. Blood work is drawn and sent to the laboratory for analysis. Test results reveal antibodies produced against a parasite often spread by cysts found in cat feces. Which of the following is true about her infection? A. Her blood would agglutinate if exposed to sheep serum. B. The parasite may cause retinal inflammation of the fetus. C. She is at risk for the development of brain lesions. Or D. Sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine should be withheld. Hopefully from the question stem you notice that this patient has toxoplasmosis. She has a fever, sore throat, and fatigue. All classic yet non-specific symptoms of toxoplasmosis in a healthy patient. But the blood work indicates antibodies against a parasite. This refers to serology, or evaluation of the patient's antibodies in the blood. And we are led to believe that the parasite is toxoplasma, since it's spread by cysts and cat feces. With toxoplasma in mind, the correct answer is choice B. The parasite may cause retinal inflammation of the fetus. Recall that toxoplasma can cross the placenta and infect the fetus, and the symptoms of a fetal infection include hydrocephalus, intracranial calcifications, and chorioretinitis. Recall on the left of the force field barrier, the cat breaking through with a torch, indicating toxoplasma can cross the placenta and infect the fetus. Also recall the mom standing above her baby has glasses on. The lenses reflect that fire that the cat started, making reference to inflammation, specifically of the choroid and the retina, hence the term chorioretinitis. Now choice A is wrong because this describes the monospot or heterophile antibody test. This test is positive in EBV or mono infections, but negative in toxoplasmosis. So there would be no agglutination in our toxoplasma patient. Now choice C is wrong because the mother is not at risk of brain lesions. Recall that ring enhancing brain lesions occur in AIDS patients when the CD4 T cell count falls below 100. Remember that victim on the stretcher with the band-aid? She was getting her head shocked and trying to give the villain a $100 bill. Finally, choice D is wrong because sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine should not be withheld. They should be given. You may have thought this was the correct answer if you wondered if these medications were contraindicated in pregnancy. If you thought this, it's good that you're thinking this way and being concerned for the fetus. However, these medications should be given in a pregnant patient with toxoplasmosis, especially after 16 weeks gestation. But don't get lost in the weeds on this topic. Just know that you want to prevent congenital toxoplasmosis, so treat the mother's infection. And that should be all you need to know about Toxoplasma Gandhi.